This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you right there listening right now. You might be Paul Thiessen or Ali Sanjabi or Andrew Bradley. We thank you, whoever you are. Coming up on DTNS, why AI automation may make more work for you, not less. How the mini Playdate game console survived a year and DuckDuckGo's sensible approach to generative AI in search. Finally, somebody did it. Quack. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, March 8th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger. But who am I when I'm not in Los Angeles? Tom the Talking Cat is my name. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. He's from MySpace. Oh. He's that Tom. <laughs> I'm your oh. friend. Oh. And as your friend, I recommend we start with the quick hits a bit of Google news today. The company announced it will hold its annual I.O. developer conference as an in-person event on May 10th at the Shoreline Amphitheater, which is near its headquarters in California. Keynotes and technical sessions will be available live streamed and also on demand with free virtual registration now open. Google's VPN product is rolling out to all Google One subscribers as well. That includes the $2 a month basic plan subscribers. Before now, it was only available to members on the premium two terabyte plan. So all the Google One subscribers get it. You can share that VPN with up to five people if they are on your Google One plan. Google also added a dark web report that looks for your personal information in data breaches and lets you know if it finds it, along with guidance about what to do about it. And Google is rolling out spatial audio with head tracking to its Pixel Buds Pro wireless headphones. Google rolled out static spatial audio support to the Pixel phones in January. Spotify is redesigning the home screen of its app to favor vertical scrolling while discovering new content beyond just music, like podcasts, audiobooks, live audio, and more. Spotify announced this at its Stream On event on Wednesday. Among the announcements is more personalized AI in the Smart Shuffle feature, which temporarily adds tracks to your existing playlists, DJ the AI spinning records, and hosting your own personal radio show, Tom Merritt. Thank you, Sarah Lane. And now more August D. Uh, Ring launched the $180 Battery Doorbell Plus, its first new doorbell since 2021. It offers a square 1536p 150 by 150 degree view, lets users see a visitor's entire body from head to toe, uh, as well as any packages that might be like sitting on the porch. Uses the same battery as the Ring Doorbells 3 and 4, but also offers some software tweaks to improve battery life compared to those models. Available for pre-order now, ship in April 5th, and a reminder, uh, Ring did move a couple of features into the subscription plan. So before you buy it, make sure that that is still cool with you. We previously told you about Project Texas, a plan to separate U.S. user data on TikTok from the rest of the company, with Oracle in charge of the data processing. Now Europe's got their own version of sorts. TikTok revealed a new set of security measures for Europe called Project Clover, which will see a third-party security company audit its data control and practices and set up security gateways that determine which employees can access European user data. The company also announced plans for two new data sets centers in Ireland, along with one that was previously announced in Norway. TikTok will migrate European user data to these servers, aiming for completion in 2024. One of these other data centers needs to be called Crimson. So you can have oh. Project Crimson and Project Clover. I like that. Over. Over and over. Yeah. yeah. Data centers. <laughs> All right, guys. Inflation has come for the play date. You say, play date? What? I, I haven't even been to it. Jungle Gym recently. <laughs> For those unfamiliar, the Play Day that we're talking about here is a yellow mini game console that came out last April for $179. Its games are controlled by a crank. It's also made by a company called Panic. They're based in Portland, Oregon, best known for a lot of Mac software, such as the FTP client Transmit. They've been doing it for a long time, as well as for Untitled Goose Game, which is a lot of fun, I suppose. I've never played it. But sadly, the Playdate price is rising to $199 on April 7th, but not for no reason. Anything ordered before will get the old price, including existing pre-orders, and there are quite a few of them. So let's talk about why the price is going up. 
Yeah, Panic CEO Cable Nasser said, and I'm going to quote him here, our factory recently gave us the inevitable news that in 2023, the price of building a single play date is going up. Our margins are already surprisingly slim. So although we've absorbed a lot of weird price increases on this weird journey, this is the one we couldn't avoid. And we are truly sorry. Uh, so that makes sense. Prices are going up everywhere. Price of the play date's going to do that too. However, the latest software update does include a game store. So whether you're paying 179 or 199, you're going to get more on that device. The catalog, as they call their game store, lets you buy and download games from the device instead of having to sideload. There are 15 titles at launch, two of which are free. The rest are either one to fifteen dollars, and you pay by credit card. And don't worry if you like sideloading to the play date, you can still do that too. They're not taking that away they're just adding the catalog to make some things easier uh scott are you surprised that it's a year later almost and we're still talking about the play date a little bit um it's a st such a strange device from conception on forward a lot of people really like the things this company does i do they've made some really cool games in the past as well and sarah mentioned one or two of them um so i knew i knew when this thing launched that they had a real passion project on their hands and i thought the price seemed okay at the time but Boy, was their timing bad. I mean, it was right before, um, you know, things got so hard with uh, trying to get uh, logistics working in the rest of the world during the pandemic. And they were hit by that. And delays and pre-orders were a lot more than they expected. And as far as I know, I don't, I don't even think the first round has been fully fulfilled yet. They're doing pre-orders for the next round. And one would presume these pre-orders outside of ones that are already done are going to have this new price. Um I would just say this. I, I guess I would say to gamers, if this was something that jumped out at you and you sort of thought, well, this is interesting, um, keep in mind a couple of things. It's aimed at a very nostalgic sort of uh, nerve. That's what they're aiming for. They're saying, look, uh, how do you feel about a monochromatic screen like the old days? Uh, what if we put a weird crank on the side? And what if it otherwise only had the controls that an original Game Boy did? Those limitations are part of the fun. And the games are all going to be these strange little indie titles, many of which they're making uh, and letting other people make. If all of that sounds like your jam, then I think the extra price is probably going to be fine. Um, and they've already sold enough of these that the, I don't think they're worried about a, a big enough player base to take advantage of this quote unquote store or, or catalog as they're calling it. Um, so to answer your question, not, it's not that I'm surprised that it's still kicking. I think the demand was there. I guess I'm surprised that that they've still that they're still at that demand level like i just can't believe yeah that, that they never caught people. up yeah. yeah that they never truly caught up like the way the steam deck did huh. or even car, the right, way cars right. did so some of that stuff is a little surprising and i i hope they get caught up because it'd be nice to just go there and buy one you know you're still pre-ordered right i'm on a pre-order list of some sort they're supposed to let me know when i'm in the the payment mm -hmm. queue and then I get to make a decision at that point. It's a little, it's a kind of the same thing Steam did. They just had a much smaller window of delay uh, for the for the Steam Deck, and you know, Valve's a giant company with uh, maybe a bigger reach or whatever. But sure. hey, don't get too comfortable with that price either, because my prediction is next year we're going to be paying more for Steam Decks as well. I I guess uh, you know, not having played around with the play date, uh, but understanding that you know this is a cool novelty mm -hmm. uh game console of sorts uh you know if you like panic or you know even if you don't know or care about the company otherwise you know this is a fun thing that i think you know a lot of gamers are like yeah why not yeah. 20 dollar price increase does not seem that significant to me especially when you have other companies increasing prices by uh, much more or certainly slashing prices by much more um you know in the event that they're trying to you know get rid of uh some some uh, some some hardware merch, you know, in uh, in the event that there's an updated version on the horizon type stuff. Right. I wonder, you know, how how much would how much would it have to be to say, well, I really wanted this and now I'm out. Well, I see. I already worry that now we're at 200. That's pushing up against other gaming solutions. If that's what you're out there for. See, the thing is, yeah. I don't think there are too many people, gamers included, that are in the market for this device because they're choosing it over something else. That's not the kind of platform this is. This is more like, I really like video games. I'm nostalgic for the handholds of yesterday. This looks like a real stab in that direction and it's new content and that sounds like fun. But this is not going to be anybody's main gaming platform, um, even over mobile for that matter. So it's already a novelty. You use the right word. It is a novelty in a lot of ways. 
And the higher that price goes, the closer it gets to less, you know, other things that aren't quite as novel, like a switch, a light. A switch light is not that far off from this. I think it's 50 bucks more than this now. Mm -hmm. And so when you take that 20 bucks, it doesn't seem like much, but that's actually a pretty big jump towards something like a switch, which is, you know, a much more versatile and, and a, a diverse platform. So I think they have to be careful with that. I don't think this thing can go much more than 200, especially for what it is. Um, but I, but I think, you know, they've done, they've done okay so far. And I think in the immediate interim time here, before other things start going up in price, people who want this are still going to get it. And I think, you know, uh, it's not worth, uh, ignoring that they, they treat their customers well. Uh, they came out and explained, Hey, we don't want to raise the price, but we have to, here's why. And we're going to give you a month. Uh, you know, we're going to give you plenty of notice that it's going to go up and we'll still honor the old price until that point. Not all of you are going to be able to order it because of the shortage, but you know, I, I think treating your audience with respect goes a long way to continuing to have the demand because people like the company. They're more likely to like the product. Yeah. They've always done that too. I remember buying transmit for the first time. It's an FTP client for Mac. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's them who made it. And they have always been ridiculously over the top helpful when I've had questions, problems, code issues, whatever. So this just feels like this is who they are, which is why they made it in the first place. It's just kind of this is their passion and, uh, you know, good on them. But it is a little unfortunate that we're going to have to pay a little bit more. All right. A lot of folks out there are excited that new generative AI tools are going to save them time, going to going to let them let them do work faster. A lot of folks are worried that these generative AI tools are going to replace them, that there there won't be any work left for them to do. Well, Barbara Ribeiro, an associate professor in innovation management and policy at the University of Manchester, wrote a paper in the journal Research Policy earlier this year called the digitalization paradox of everyday scientific labor, how mundane knowledge work is amplified and diversified in the biosciences. And if you didn't follow that journalistic title, in other words, automating some work in a lab increased the work humans had to do. And in fact, it increased the boring, the mundane work humans had to do. Here's why. Yeah, so Ribeiro studied labs that work in synthetic biology, also known as SynBio. It can be dangerous, as Tom will discuss in detail in an upcoming episode of A Word with Tom Merritt. But it can also be used for non-dangerous things, like growing lab meat, or figuring out better ways of creating fertilizers, drug discovery. And SynBio experiments rely on advanced robotic platforms, moving large numbers of samples and machine learning, analyzing those results. This is supposed to save scientists time. Yeah, they can do a lot more experiments because they've got all this automation. But what Professor Ribeiro found was that lab managers used that extra time to do more experiments. But not every part of an experiment is automated. You've got to train the robots on each new experiment. If you do 10 times as many experiments, you got to train them 10 times as many times. You have to check for errors 10 times as many times. You have to standardize the results and share the results 10 times as many times. Not to mention troubleshooting, cleaning, and maintenance now is 10 times as many times. Ribeiro calls this the digitalization paradox. If you don't automate every part of a task, automation can amplify and multiply the amount of non-automated tasks associated with the automated one in a way that ends up not saving time for everyone, but increasing overall work. Now, call me crazy, but doesn't this sound like a temporary, more mundane work sure. for a human rather than something that is, you know, just is a part of life. You know, if you're training the robot to do the right thing, well, maybe it's not doing it the right way at first, but you get there and then you kind of go, okay, well, I don't have to do that every Tuesday. Type sure. Thing. Well, but you have to train the robot for every new experiment. True. So, yeah, I, the I smarter mean, they get, the more you work. I guess the, and, and you have to clean up for every new experiment. I, and I guess where you could go with this, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing where you're going to go is like, sure, but then you can automate the cleaning up and you can automate the troubleshooting. And at some point you can automate all these things that the humans are doing. The question is, how long is that going to take? Mm. Right? Because yeah. this isn't like, oh, tomorrow we can automate it all, or they would have automated all of that already. These are the parts, like error correction particularly, where a human looks over things and like, okay, yes, it did it right. 
that's that's going to be a long time before we trust that to automation. Yeah, and I know, I know this comes up a lot on the show, and I bring it up a lot. But you know, when we ended up with spreadsheet software in the late '80s, early '90s, everybody was afraid it was going to take these jobs away. Instead, it provided a ton more to do because the mundane is being done by these systems, and now everybody can work on other stuff that gets us more money. And it became a boom for them rather than a, a dip. I think that's probably going to be true in this case, and I think I agree with this argument. The real world down on the dirt example that I experienced here recently was being in a grocery store and reminding myself that these self checkout machines that have gotten really good at weighing stuff, scanning stuff, being really good at knowing what's in the bag and what you didn't put in yet. And they're, they're really smart. Um, they still require it, or this store anyway, it requires three people to be kind of like walking around, making sure everything's working, checking your receipt. Oh, this lady didn't do a thing, right? I'll come fix it for you. I'll reset it. Troubleshooting, whatever. Um, and we've been doing those for a long time. And as far as I can tell, no robots are just running the store uh, the way that we all maybe thought was going to happen. And we were going to eliminate the need for for baggers and checkers and everybody else. So I just feel like this is the same kind of thing, but but even more so. You're talking about exponentially being able to expand how much you can do with, say, these experiments so that you can then focus on other stuff and you'll still have the jobs to maintain these the needs that these that these machines, these robots, whatever, need to get the experiments done in the first place. Yeah, I, I think I think it's easy to 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 get mixed up on the, the there's different effects of automation, right? What you're talking about with grocery store is the automation didn't eliminate jobs; it just reduced them. So right. what might have been six checkers is still three. Right. What this is saying is it actually, in some cases, increases the work. So if it was the grocery store, it would mean like we automated things and now we need 10 checkers because mm -hmm. we because these other parts of it are now so big. The you know, the, the 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 like the fact that we have 10 times as many experiments means we need 10 times as much cleaning, which means we need 10 times as much troubleshooting, which means people are working 10 times as hard at those jobs. Yeah, mm -hmm. it saved the experiment part of the job, but in some cases and it won't be all cases it actually increases things. And to your point, Sarah, yeah, at some point we'll be able to automate all that other stuff and then it really will be a huge time saver. Yeah. But at what point, but how long is that going to take? Some of that stuff won't be automated for decades, you know, or, or even in my lifetime. Well, and when you're talking about uh, a tool, um, you know, for lack of a better word, that gets smarter and smarter and does more over time, you have to continually train that tool to do that. So yeah, I mean, if... In a grocery store scenario, it's like, okay, can we just get to the point where the customers aren't always messing things up at the self checkout, where a uh, you know a store employee has to come over and like help them and reset and you know zero out you know whatever balance they'd racked up type thing. Well, then then yeah, then it is kind of plug and play, and that's great. You know that's that's the idea. Um, you know, make everybody working at the grocery store do the stuff that you know they're better at doing anyway. Uh, but so much of what we're talking about are tasks um, that are being defined. Still. Yeah. So, so you know. we have an experiment that used to take uh, a month. And now that experiment takes a day because we've automated the experiment. Right. But in every one of those experiments, uh, you have to uh, run a training data set. And that takes an hour. Uh, and you yeah. have to clean up after it. And that takes an hour. And so it used to be an hour at the beginning of the month, an hour at the end of the month. Uh, now you can do one every day. It's an hour at the beginning of the day, an hour at the end of the day. Now you're doing adding 60 hours of work that used to be two hours <laughs> because you can do so many things. It, 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 the thing it reminds me the most of is adding lanes to a highway. It seems like, oh, we have too much traffic. Add a lane to the highway so we can accommodate more traffic. And what happens in real life is when you add a lane to a highway, more, more cars <laughs> show up and start using it. Yeah, uh, yeah it's the same kind of thing. Uh, well, folks, so what, what do you think about this or any of the things we talk about on Daily Tech News Show? Let us know on the social networks. You can find us on Twitter at DTNS Show. You can find us on TikTok at Daily Tech News Show and on Instagram, DTNS Picks. That's DTNS P-I-X. 
DuckDuckGo is bringing some AI to its search, but in a different way from Bing. The privacy-focused search company is using a combination of OpenAI's DaVinci language model, uh, that's actually one that, that helps do conversations, and Anthropic, a different company, actually run by a former OpenAI guy, Anthropic's Claude model, which is a chat model similar to ChatGPT. It's combining those models from two different companies to deliver a limited set of responses. The product is called Duck Assist, and it can only deliver answers from a limited set of sources. And in fact, DuckDuckGo's founder, Gabe Weinberg, told TechCrunch that for now, more than 99% of the answers are coming from Wikipedia. Uh, he said Encyclopedia Britannica is in there a little bit, handful of other sources. So it's not going to show up for everything you search on on DuckDuckGo. Well, however, if you search for something that Duck Assist thinks it can answer, a magic wand icon will show up at the top of these search results, asking if you want to look at a Wikipedia uh, entry for the answers. And if you do want to look at Wikipedia for those, you tap the Ask button. Don't tell Jeeves. Uh, anyway, although if another DuckDuckGo user has already searched for the same question, the Duck Assist answer will automatically show up, so you won't get different answers for the exact same question. So right now, Duck Assist is available on browser extensions and also apps and will roll out to all searches in the coming weeks. DuckDuckGo also helps to expand the number of sources it uses over time as well. I actually just got uh, finally early access to uh, the new Bing chat um, mm. feature that I've been waiting for for a while. You know, played around with it, you know, over the last few days. And I'm trying to figure out, okay, well, what, which one of these makes more sense to me? Um, again, we're talking early days, um, but I like the I like DuckDuckGo's um, uh, you know the the way that it's like listen uh, we're kind of limited right now, but if we have something that might be available to you, magic wand, click yeah. it, maybe you get something out of it. Mm -hmm. Well, but you don't if, really if the have magic to... wand shows up, you will get something out of it. Yeah. But yeah, if it doesn't will. show up, then you don't have to worry about it. That's exactly. nice. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But you, you don't necessarily have to be like, hmm, what's my query going to be if I want to use, you know, right. the chat functionality. You kind of just do your thing and then maybe you get a bonus. And there's no gaming the system where you're like, let me trick Bing into saying something horrible. It's just, <laughs> yeah, it's just right. there if it's there. That's the other part of this. If someone has asked the same question and got a an AI answer before and you ask that question, it'll just show you that answer. It's right. not going to rerun the query. It's because it's limited. It's saying we just trained it to look at Wikipedia and summarize it. So it's better than just taking a quote because sometimes your question would require like three different parts of a Wikipedia article and search engines aren't good at that. But this is, this can look at that and go like, oh, it's these three parts and let me rephrase that in a more sensible way. I think this is a sensible is the word. I think sense, this is a sensible way to include some of that large language model magic in a useful way that like you said, Sarah, doesn't make you think, doesn't make you go like, oh, should I use the Bing chat this time or just the regular search? Right, engine? right. Yeah. yeah. I also like that it, is starting from an inf information base that's reliable but containable. And this is kind of hard to explain, so I'll try to explain it. They use Wikipedia as the base of operations for this initial push. That doesn't mean, like they said, they even use a little Brit Britannica here and there. It doesn't mean that they can't expand past that and use other sources of information to answer some of these questions. But starting there, I think, is just a really strong move. Like That's a place with a lot of really great curated, or uh, not curated, but moderated information Mm -hmm. It's my favorite resource on the web. I was asked the other day if there was one thing I could cut out or the one thing I would not want to cut out of my internet life. I think it's Wikipedia because it just is the mm. go-to when I need info on something. And as much as we all you know, think of it as ubiquitous or we like to make fun of, well, sometimes people go in and hack pages. Like it's, it's fun to go all those directions. But if we're really honest about it, Wikipedia has been one of the like tent poles of reliable information on the internet in a centralized place or in a place I just know where to go to get it. And well, I think starting yeah. there is strong. I like that they're they're beginning there. You know? It's not perfect, but it's a known error quantity. Right, right, right. <laughs> Good way. Well, and, it. you know, for anyone who's like, yeah, but I mean, what are they really doing? They're just bundling Wikipedia into certain, like, you know, you could just go there and do all of that. Sure. Also true. Go but there, do we, it. 
With, right. <laughs> like Find out you, how easy it is. Yeah, you can, yeah. You can still you 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 don't have to you know choose one or the other. And I think that um, anything that involves, I mean, I, I can't tell you how much time I spend on Wikipedia just looking for like little factoids that may or may not, you know, have anything to do with my life or my work type stuff for it to just be referenced and uh, easily brought up in, in other ways instead of going somewhere, searching for something. You know, if I want to find something on Wikipedia right now, I have a very specific way of doing so. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I think many of us would say, yeah, I mean, you know, it takes five seconds. Sure. But what if we do it a different way? Yeah. And that's, yeah. you know, that's the fun of this, I think. Well, and, and that, the other thing is, if I ask, like, what is the population of Daegu, South Korea? Uh, if I get just regular search engine, I will find a link. Maybe it'll be in the summary if I'm lucky. I'll probably have to click through and then search to find it. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's a quote... I'll probably have a good chance of a quote pulled out of a Wikipedia article that says the population of Daegu, South Korea is 2.4 million people or whatever it is, right? Uh, but those don't always work. Sometimes it gets cut off or sometimes it says the population was in 1990 and then in 2000, you know, because it's quoting the wrong part. What this tool does is says, oh, we understand what you're what you're asking and we will give you exactly the answer. The population is this right at the top. You don't have to click through. You don't have to search around for it. And I think that's I think that's useful. Yeah. And per usual, uh, DuckDuckGo is not having you be logged in for any of this. You just right. use it. Uh, no data associated with you is being pushed it's around. It's not using your questions to train or anything. It's not nope. storing any of that. And yeah. that, to yeah. me, is just as important in, the ca in their case because their entire identity is armored in those concepts, in those precepts. And if they didn't do that stuff, I don't think it would be DuckDuckGo anymore. So I, for yeah. one, am happy about that as a regular user of the service. And I'm excited to see how this pans out over time. Yeah, me too. Well, if any of us are planning on traveling for an extended period of time and we want a secure way to get our mail, snail mail, you know, something that would go to your mailbox or maybe a post office, without paying for an expensive service, Chris Christensen has an answer. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. If you're doing long-term travel, some people will sign up for a mail delivery system where all their mail gets sent to someplace, it gets opened and scanned and sent to them electronically, which is a useful system, but it can be expensive. If you want the poor man's version of that and you've got a friend who's picking up your mail, if you live in the U.S., you can sign up for free for informed delivery. And informed delivery will send you an email of the outside of any email or packages that are coming to you so you can tell your friend to send those over or maybe just open them for you. And the name of that free service, again, is Informed Delivery. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Oh, I, I use this. I, I have this. And it's, it's, it's great to be able to say like, oh, yeah, that thing I wanted is coming today. Oh, I'm getting a letter from the IRS. Now I'm nervous all day. You know, that, that kind of <laughs> yeah. stuff. Yeah. I've been using that, too. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, this one comes in from Andy. So we briefly mentioned Just Watch. It's an app on the show yesterday and our discussion of streaming services and what your options are if you're trying to figure out what to watch and where. Just Watch is manually created. We mentioned that. So it's not always 100% up to date. But Andy loves it. He says, this is great for telling you which of your services has a show or movie that you're looking for or where you can rent or subscribe from other services. If you have time, you can train it by telling it what shows or movies you like or dislike. For example, Happy Valley, uh, season one, episode two, available on the CBC. But season one, episode three, not available yet. So I'm not going to waste my time looking for it. It will notify me when it's available. Yeah, uh, we had a lot of people on Twitter, Mastodon, uh, saying similar things of like, oh, this is why I like to use Chromecast, Fire TV, Roku. I like, like you named yeah. all the platforms, different ones of you, because I can search and it will tell me uh, what service has the thing. We So so I'm sorry if we were not clear yesterday. We weren't saying that's, that feature didn't exist we said it's not very good like it's not comprehensive it's not the same across platforms some platforms have some things indexed some other platforms don't some like netflix actively work to stop themselves from being indexed so sometimes it's just wrong it'll tell you something is there and it's not uh and, and that's what we were talking about is like these features exist they're just not 
reliable yet and we want them to be reliable and so andy pointing out that just watch is great for stuff I, i'm glad he did because i agree i use just watch all the time but even just watch sometimes is wrong sometimes it says the thing isn't available that is sometimes it has it on the wrong service you know we're at 90 percent. we're just saying we'd like to get it to 100 percent, or at yeah. least as close as possible and there are some competing services obviously that do this sort of thing that does and they're just all watch does. they're all they all fall short in they the same way they all have fail yeah. states yeah it's yeah. a real bummer but i i will say just watch way more often right than not for me well you know who's always right is scott johnson being oh, on this here show dang because right. it makes it better uh scott <laughs> let folks know where you can find more of your work okay well i can tell you an exact <laughs> place to go for that frogpants.com will get you all the different podcasts you like gaming are you into that you like morning shows do you like uh, uh film stuff we got something for everybody, so go check it out. That's film sack, or sorry, <laughs> that is uh, frogpants.com. And, uh, of course, <laughs> as always, you can find me on the Twitters, at Scott Johnson. We also have brand new bosses to thank. This is a very exciting day for us because we love to thank new bosses. Pete and Techno Mensch, a.k.a. Mark, just started backing us on Patreon. So big thanks to you, Pete, and big thanks to you, Techno Mensch, if yes. I can call you that. You are, you, you are a Mensch, both of you. Uh, and uh, we appreciate you supporting us. Please welcome them into the Patreon fold. All of you other patrons, give them a, a good hearty handshake slap on the back. You know, good to see you uh, because they are going to be able to get the extended show Good Day Internet right now, just like everybody else. Stick around. We're going to talk about swearing. Uh, YouTube is easing its monetization restrictions on swearing in videos. Do we like that? Heck yeah. Or maybe heck no. Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about that. So stick around. But just a reminder, you can catch this show, DTNS is live, Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Tell a friend. We'll be back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young joining us. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>